When we take more responsibility for training our mind, the way we think about it is strength and conditioning for the mind. So we think about this in sport, no athlete would ever take the field of competition without training their body, yet all the time it happens with their minds and not training their minds for certain qualities. So we're flipping that, we're training the mind to have certain qualities. It is time to kick things officially off uh, to our Educator Wellness Series. This is our first season of doing this, and this is our season one finale, episode seven, and we are going to be applying practical meditation strategies to the K-12 um, environment. And I'm excited to introduce our guests in just a moment here. Um, this is our final one of the school year, um, and I'm going to close uh, out uh, the season at the very end. But if you have any ideas for anybody you think would be really great uh, as a guest speaker for next year, please let us know by emailing me at nick at edelements.com. Um, I am a senior design principal here at Education Elements, and I get to work with school districts all over the country. Um, so Chad is going to be uh, talking about talking to us about um, practical meditation strategies in the K-12 environment. And the reason he's talking about it is because he's an expert in terms of meditation. He's a coach. He's a researcher, as you can see by the champion of volleyball uh, banner behind him, as well as his Polo. He works at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he works um, with their sports department using meditation strategies to increase performance. The things that jumped out at me is like, as a big sports fan, the fact that he was featured on ESPN, Wall Street Journal, NPR, he's gotten to work with hostage crisis, uh, rescue teams, Quantico, Fortune 500 companies, and all of that. But what I'm really excited is that he's get, he's been able to tailor his uh, meditation strategies to the environments that we all um, work in. And what I think is really interesting, and I'm hoping that we can definitely talk about this today, is the fact that um, a lot of these strategies, but also the reason that these strategies are important, are universal, right? Like they can transcend the different places that people work. Um, and I think that is a really good thing for all of us to know that these are not just school things. These are people things um, that we're going to talk about today. So with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, let Chad jump onto his, but I'm really excited to talk to Chad today. So take it away, bud. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, uh, Nick and the whole team at Education Elements for the opportunity to join today. Super excited to be with the, the whole group. So I'm just going to talk for, for a little bit, you know, 15, 20 minutes or so, kind of share some things that are helpful. And then I was going to get into it with some dialogue. And um, yeah, so I'm Chad and I'm a meditation coach. And honestly, sometimes when I say that, people still have traditional stereotypical images come to mind, right? Well, uh, what I do is I train and I research rigorous meditation training in high performance environments. So those stereotypes aren't gonna last very long. So in our next stretch of time, if I do my job, this is the terrain that we're gonna to cover today. You're gonna to have a pretty good sense of what meditation is, both the scientific and the applied foundations of how this work shows up and how it can be valuable for your performance and your well being. I wanna say this off the top really, really clear, uh, the focus today is for you, the educator. I want to give just a little bit of background about myself and kind of how this work came to be. So I'm originally from small town, Illinois, uh, and had, you know, good upbringing, you know, playing in my friend's parents' barns and playing soccer and, you know, just having a good time. And, uh, and then at the end of my high school career, a bunch of suffering showed up. Uh, and I remember being in my parents' backyard and feeling like I had a choice. I could either run from this suffering, I could hide from this suffering, or I could find a way to go through it. And something in me quivered and said, you have to find a way to go through it. And I had no idea how to do that. So that put me on a path. And ultimately, it was mindfulness and meditation that gave me the supports and the practices in a day-to-day, moment-to-moment way to be able to navigate that period of life. And then that suffering changed. And these practices were still a huge support for me as Chad, as a guy living his life. And then my first career was as a public school teacher. Um, I started teaching my career internationally in Ecuador. And then as a bilingual person, I had a K-12 emergency license, eventually got fully licensed, was able to teach K-12. Uh, and I was meditating. I was benefiting from this. And I, this was before there were many good resources for mindfulness and education. I still train, as Nick mentioned, in law enforcement environments, mostly at the federal level. I train with FBI SWAT teams across the country and the Tier 1 Special Forces team based at Quantico. And then athletes. So I was a college soccer player myself. I always saw how this stuff could show up in sport environments or thought it could show up in sport environments. 
but have an orientation that you don't teach meditation until you're asked to teach. So an opportunity emerged about seven or eight years ago with a guy who played football here in Wisconsin and played in the NFL. His name's Chris Borland. And after Chris retired from the NFL, he wanted to do something to benefit guys who played the game. Long story short, we created this eight-week mindfulness-based training for a group of 17 retired NFL guys. But there's some things in here that are implicit that I want to make explicit. White, male, straight, cisgendered, a whole bunch of other identities that have continued to impact me in my life. And while I do my work to understand that and try to interrupt those systems of oppression, I'm my mistakes. And when I do that, please call me out, call me in. So one of the foundational things that we know about mindfulness and meditation is the simple truth of neuroplasticity, right? So neuroplasticity is just the, the basic scientific idea that all of our brains are built to learn. It's just what they do. Uh, the question is, who's in charge of the process of training for the qualities that we have in our own minds? Do we leave it up, kind of the swirling winds of circumstance, or do we train our minds for certain qualities that we know are going to be supportive for performance and well-being? Just quick side note on neuroplasticity. You know, there are there seem to be periods of life when there's greater plasticity and a greater development, you know, in, in young people. But it's also true that our brains are developing throughout the lifespan. You know, the old science was you get to 20, 25 and your brain's kind of developing and then it's just a slow dendrite fall off for the rest of time from there on out. It's just not true. That's not how it works, right? Brains are developing throughout the lifespan. When we take more responsibility for training our mind, the way we think about it is strength and conditioning for the mind. So we think about this in sport. No athlete would ever take the field of competition without training their body. Yet all the time it happens with their minds and not training their minds for certain qualities. So we're flipping that. We're training the mind to have certain qualities. But what qualities are we training for? So when I think about this strength and conditioning for the mind metaphor, I remember the first time I walked into the Wisconsin football weight room. I go up to one of these coaches, you know, a strength coach, and no joke, he's like one of these Under Armour mannequins come to life. Like, I didn't know real humans had shoulders that big. Hey, coach, what do you do around here, right? He says, you know, my job is to get guys bigger, faster, stronger. Of course, I'd seen that thousands of times, sides of weight rooms, on plates, you know, whatever it may be. And I thought, well, what's the corollary to what I'm interested in? And it's this. It's training the mind to be more focused, more resilient, and be better teammates. And not just talking about it, but training for it. So if we think about this in sport, would athletes, would coaches perform better if they're more focused, more resilient, better teammates? How about you as a teacher, as an educator, as a principal? whatever identities you have outside of school, would you be better at those things if you were more focused, more resilient, better teammate? Absolutely, right? So how do we train for them? So this is how we're going to spend our time, you know, the rest of our time here this afternoon is exploring each of these a little bit more. So beginning with attention, training the mind to be more focused. I cannot overstate the importance of attention. Your attention is involved in every single moment of your day. And if you're not paying attention to what your attention is doing, you're leaving huge elements of your performance and well-being to chance. So think about it. How many times as educators, parents, or we think back to when we were kids, how many times have you said or been told to pay attention? Hundreds, thousands of times, right? How many times has somebody taught you how to pay attention? Probably never. We just like expect it to magically happen. Well, that's of course not how the brain works. This is Attention and the networks of attention are a skill that we can develop. They've done this fascinating research where they send people text messages. First text message is, what are you doing? Second text message is, what are you paying attention to? So I invite everyone on the call, just reflect, like, during your day, what percentage of time do you think you're paying attention to what you're doing? And what they find is most folks are paying attention to what they're doing 47% of the time. So half the time we're locked in, we know what's going on. And we all know what that feels like. We all know what it feels like to be reading something, get to the end of the page and have no idea what we read, right? Or be talking to somebody and have completely lost track of what's going on, right? And so this is a skill and the science is clear that this number, this 47%, we can tick it up. We can get better in this area. And all aspects of your life would be improved if we could have that attention be where we want it to be a little more often. The last part of this kind of skill of attention I think is really foundational is this metaphor of the eye of the hurricane. So this comes from George Mumford. So George is a meditation teacher who Phil Jackson with the Bulls and Lakers brought in. And George talks about this eye of the hurricane, right? The sense of stability, balance, okayness, while the storm rages all around. 
that eye of the hurricane is mindfulness. It's the same quality. And all of us know what that feels like. We know what it feels like when there's a lot going on, whether it's you know, in the classroom, in a school, in our life, right? And we're okay, we're balanced in the midst of it. And we also know what it feels like to be swept into that storm and kind of lose that sense of balance and equanimity. Most of us don't know how to train to experience that stability more often. Well, that's what we're doing with mindfulness. We get swept into the storm, no problem. We can train to come back to that eye of the hurricane. And just imagine the implications on your teaching, on your preparation, on other aspects of your life if you had more of this eye of the hurricane in your life. So now moving on to more resilience. So resilience, of course, is a really important concept. But when I'm thinking about resilience, in particular, I'm thinking about this capacity as Sharon Salzberg calls it, to begin again, regardless of what happens. Really tough moment, really great moment. Best day of your education career, worst day of your education career. How do we come back and bring our best each moment, each day? To get at this, I want to share a little bit of science. So this is a study we did at the Center of Early Minds, um, kind of a seminal study a number of years ago, looking at recovery from negative events. In this study, there's two groups of people. There's non-meditators, so no practice experience, and long-term meditators, lots of practice experience. We had them in the fMRI, so in the brain scanner, and we're looking at the part of their brain that's responsible for perception of pain. The study design was that the participants would hear a sound, just like a phone, and then they had a band on their wrist, and really hot water would come through that band, just below the level of burning. So they started to pair. Sound happens, negative stimulus is coming. So let's see what happens in the study. So here we're beginning with the long-term meditator. So you can see they're in the pain network or they're in the fMRI. The part of their brain responsible for pain is stable. And then they hear that sound and it stays stable. And then that heat shock comes, that negative stimulus is there, shoots way up. That heat shock is there for a moment or two and then it's gone, comes back down to baseline. So now let's take a look at the other group. So these are the non-meditators, these folks with no practice experience. So you can see they begin in the fMRI and the pain network is pretty stable. And then the sound comes. And what do you think happens with this group just upon hearing the sound? Exactly, shoots way up. And remember, this is just hearing the sound. The negative stimulus has not arrived yet. And then the negative stimulus comes, that heat shock is there, the heat shock is there for a moment or two, and then it's gone. And what do you think happens? Absolutely. It stays elevated for a really long time. So what is this telling us? How does this reflect some of what we experience every day? I'm sure all of us see ourselves in some ways in this slide. We know what it's like to just get that email from an administrator and all of a sudden, boom, we're way up, right? You know, we all love all of our students, but there's some students that you see them walking down the hallway and all of a sudden, like the heart rate starts to climb, right? Like things get going. This, the brain doesn't know the difference between a real threat and a perceived threat. It responds all the same, right? So how many times do you experience some level of difficulty or challenge during the day? Once, twice, a couple times a day, of course, right? Like all the time, right? It just keeps coming. And while we're not gluttons for punishment, there's a lot of difficulties that's just gonna keep coming. One, because we're human beings. Two, because we're human beings who have chosen to work in a high intensity environment like education. These challenges are going to come. So the question isn't how do we get rid of every difficulty and challenge? Part of the question then becomes, what are you doing to train to come back down the baseline more quickly? We need good answers to that question. Because even if you think, you know, you have an interaction with a student, right? Or uh, do the rest of the, and it's, maybe it's a difficult interaction, do the rest of the students get together and say, like, we'll just take the rest of the day, we'll, like, completely have our act together, we'll listen to everything that happens, you know, first-time listeners. Of course not, right, you know? So then the next student interaction comes. How are you going to perform if you're here or if you're here? Completely differently. A lot of us, unfortunately, live our days in this space where we're elevated the entire time. And that, of course, is going to lead to burnout, it's going to lead to dissatisfaction, right? So I think there's a talent retention case to be made here. And also, when we start to get to the end of the day, if we've lived here and all of a sudden it's 345, then we're just gassed. We have no energy for whatever it is that comes at the end of the day. So we have to train to be able to come back down to baseline more quickly. So continuing to move us forward through this paradigm that we're talking about, a more focused, more resilient, and better 
teammate. And when I say better teammate here, I want to be really clear that, yes, I'm talking about the people that you work with. Those are part of your teammates, right? But it's also other relationships you have in your lives, friends, families, you know, people inside of your community. And of course, the most important relationship you have is with all number one and how do we cultivate a healthy relationship there. But we have to know kind of what's the fundamentals that we're working with in our own minds. And one of the truth fundamentals that each of us have in common is we have what scientists refer to as a negativity bias. And so this negativity bias is a simple truth that as humans, we're always scanning for threat, difficulty, and challenge. And from an evolutionary perspective, this makes a lot of sense. Our ancestors needed to know really quickly, is that a lion in the bushes or is that just a breeze going through? Because if they get that wrong, we're not here. So we still have this hardwired in us. So if we're constantly scanning for difficulty, threat, and challenge, and then we work in K-12 education where there's plenty of difficulty and challenges, we also know that neuroplasticity is always happening. Your brain is constantly learning. Well, then we should expect over time that fear, cynicism, and burnout are the outcomes that should be happening. We have to interrupt that process. Mindfulness awareness can be part of that process, but there's another really important element that I think is foundational to being able to interrupt this. And that is the skill of noticing the good that is already there. We call this appreciation in the scientific framework. Of course, appreciation is a normal everyday English word. Um, and again, when we say appreciation, what we mean is noticing the good that is already there. Not this like toxic positivity of pretending things are okay when they're not. I would argue that mindfulness does a really good job of seeing things clearly, that eye of the hurricane. If it's hard, if it's difficult, we need to acknowledge that. We need to have skills to be able to be with that. But I think there's two major outcomes that come when we start to intentionally notice some of the good things that are happening in our lives. One of them is we start to see things more clearly. In any given moment, in any given day, even in a tough lesson, right? Tough reading group, a tough interaction with a parent. There was never, the whole thing was never terrible. There were always some good elements that were present in it, right? But we tend to over fixate on the negative, on the challenge part of this is the negativity bias. So if we want to perform at a high level, we need a clear and accurate picture of what's actually happening. So by noticing the good, it gives us real data, actual information on what's happening. So I think clear perception is one benefit. Another major benefit of training to notice the good is tapping into an additional fuel source. It is being able to navigate the ups and downs of a career in education by tapping into those things that help sustain us in positive ways. Educators, are really good at noticing the things that they haven't done well and fixing those things, finding those gaps and getting better at them. And of course, that's good. That's a positive thing. We always want to grow in that way. But if we're leaving this fuel source of tapping into the good underutilized, then we're leaving a major capacity to sustain us over a career, over a week, over a day, underutilized. So I wanted to share just a little bit as we start to kind of move forward and some of the scientific foundations and what we see in athletes. So as I mentioned, there's good research on the benefits of mindfulness and meditation in education. And I didn't wanna kind of recreate the wheel on what many of you know, kind of how do we extend this into athletics? And using athletics and the metaphor of sport in life, I think pertains a lot to how we perform as educators. So we see things like increased focus. We talked about that at 47%. You know, would you do a better job in your lesson planning if you weren't mind wandering? Would you do a better job in your staff meetings if you're able to lock in? Or even when you get home, whatever it is that's waiting for your home, having your attention be where you want it to be. How many of us identify as overthinkers? Anybody in the call? Probably all of us, right? In some way, shape, or form. And of course, thinking is a good thing, uh, but it can cause us difficulties, right? It can turn into rumination. It can turn into excessive regret. So being able to be aware of our thinking as it's happening and then say, is this thinking helpful? Cool, I'll go with it. Is it not helpful? No problem, I can shift away from that. Flow states. Of course, flow states are that sense of smooth, that sense of ease, that sense of concentration, that sense of absorption that all of us have felt from time to time, whether it's at work and our personal lives. What we do with mindfulness and meditation is we're training the cause and conditions for this flow states to show up more often. So we see injury prevention. 
So of course, in athletes, athletes are really concerned with injuries. You know, the best ability is availability. But for all of us, right? Like we want to be happy, healthy people and not be injured physically. Whatever you know, sort of you know, physical regimen we have. So being able to take care of our bodies is important. And of course, the mind and the body are one system. We oftentimes treat it as two different things, but it is one integrated system. So to me, it makes sense that by training the mind, we would see physical benefits show up as well. Reduce stress and anxiety. Of course, plenty of that to go around for all of us. Um, I think one of the things that's important here is these trainings aren't done. You know, I'm not a licensed mental health provider. That's not what I do. When we do these trainings in the strength and conditioning mentality, we're doing it in like a prehab sort of way. We're doing it in a preventative sort of way so that we have the skills to be able to navigate the inevitable stress and anxiety that's coming our way. And of course, increased well-being. It's not just about showing up and being better in our professional roles. When we train for the quality of being more focused, more resilient, better teammate in our minds, our mind is always with us, whether it's work, home, wherever we're at. So my question to you is this. What are you doing every day to train your mind to be stable, present, and open? You need a good answer to that question. It doesn't have to be anything major, right? It could be practices that you've done in the past that you've let go, like gratitude journals, you know, walks. It could be mindfulness and meditation practices. It could be, you know, connecting with friends, you know, in ways that are supportive for you. But we need, if we want these qualities of stable presence and open to show up, we need to train for them, which is exactly what we're doing at Wisconsin and integrating these practices into our championship teams. So this is the terrain that we set out to cover. A little bit of kind of what is meditation? How does it show up in performance environments? Some of the scientific and applied foundations, and how is it valuable for performance and well-being? So just kind of tracking some of our learning along the way. And I'll leave you with this. So we think about strength and conditioning. 50, 60 years ago, elite athletes weren't lifting weights. How to make them bulky, heavy, wear their bodies out. And of course, now strength and conditioning is embedded into every level of sport. I think what we're talking about today is going to be on a similar trajectory. Thank you, Chad. I'll share my screen just to have this slide up. Questions and conversations. Um, Chad, I'll get things started because I wrote down about half a billion of them. Um, <laughs> so we've got a bunch of different types of people on the call right now. Um, some, are, some are teachers, some are um, administrators, others work for the district. If you, I guess it's a two-pronged approach. One is, how would you get started? Like if you were people who don't do anything, um, what would you suggest is the first like easy step to make sure they can build some good, some of those good habits. And then how, uh, from the second half of that would be, how do you support people taking that first step? Yeah, absolutely. So really good question. Um, so I think especially in K-12 context, there's a, there's a good amount of resources that are available. So there's, if you're interested in this stuff, there's probably somebody else in your school or in your district who's also interested in this. So kind of forming some level of community can be really important to kind of sustain ourselves and, and benefit and learn from each other over time. On a very kind of specific granular level, I think, you know, for people to start off for themselves is uh, just taking time to do a really brief practice. It doesn't have to be daily. It could be, you know, two, three times a week. And it could be something as simple. And I'm going to lead us in a brief practice right now and invite everyone to join. Just Feel your feet on the floor. Feel the pressure. Feel the weight. The tingling. And often it said, be where your feet are. And so often we're not. Our mind is not where our feet are. So just feeling the sensations in your feet. And then your seat, where your body's making contact with the chair. And check in with your shoulders. Your jaw. You don't have to change anything, but you also may notice that things change all on their own. And then maybe pay attention to the breath a little bit. You don't have to go get the breath. The breath is already here. Just feeling the natural rhythm as it goes in and out. And now notice how things are for you after taking 60 seconds. Just scan the body, pay attention, the sensations in the body, sensations of breathing. It's it, almost like realizing that I should be paying attention to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I just realized that I wasn't paying attention to it before. It was my reaction just then. Like all of those things that you would say, like, oh yeah, I've been dealing with these things all day, 
but I hadn't thought about it. I think that was my my takeaway just then. Yeah, I think for a lot of us, the, we don't pay attention to the body until it hurts, until there's some sort of problem. Um, and so what we're doing with mindfulness, we're paying attention to things in a slightly different way. But the other thing I think is happening with, with a practice like the one we just did is if we're interested in being in the present moment more often, we need to train the mind to be with things that are happening in the present, like sensations of the body, sensations of breathing. So a lot of folks will feel calm or relaxed after these sorts of practices. And of course, there's lots of benefits to that. What are some of the biggest mindfulness meditation mistakes mm. that people might make? Um, either veterans at it or people who are getting started. Um, what are some things that we should avoid doing? Uh, yeah, in that way. Yeah, good question. So I would say the probably the biggest myth and misconception of all of mindfulness and meditation is that sometimes folks can get the idea that they're supposed to empty their mind or kind of blank their mind. Uh, and that's just not possible. Uh, the mind produces thoughts like the lungs breathe. It's just what the mind does. And so folks oftentimes would say, like, well, I'm bad at meditation because I can't stop my mind from wandering. Uh, and that's like, that hurts my heart when I hear that, right? Um, because it's not possible. Even if we go back to a little bit of what we talked about, you know, in the presentation, 47% of the time our minds are wandering. And so every time we notice attention has wandered, and then we have a choice, we can choose what we want to do with it next. The way we think about that is like doing a rep for your attention. Uh, it's actually the moment when you have the opportunity to get stronger. And even scientifically, we know, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. We're literally rewiring the brain to be more attentive every time we notice and we wander off and it kind of comes back. So I would say that's probably first and foremost, the biggest misconception is you're not bad at it. If you do it for 60 seconds and your mind wanders off 20 times and you bring it back 20 times, we well, got 20 times stronger. That's a, that's a good thing. Okay. So let's think like systems uh, for a second. So obviously, you know, a, a meditation program that you have put together for the University of Wisconsin, you had to think about what that would look like. What, what does it look like? Like, how does that training look like from a system standpoint, things that you have put together, um, you know, touch points with maybe various athletes, teams, et cetera. I'm trying to think of using that as like a bridge to what is something that a school could possibly put in place to make sure that this is a, a focus um, to help teachers in this area. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a couple of things that come to mind that we're doing in Wisconsin that can translate to school. So one is, I think about the work when with a team or with an athlete in terms of training boards. Right? So in athletics, right, it's, you know, pick a sport, right? You know, for football, it's eight weeks of winter conditioning, five weeks of spring ball, right? A little bit of break. It's summer conditioning, fall camp, season. So we've got all these natural kind of cycles in the year, training blocks in a year. So what's the skill? What's the intention for a particular training block? So I think in schools, we can do this too, right? Like whether it's monthly, quarterly, maybe we tie it in, you know, to a unit, you know, we've got like this four week unit we're doing, we're going to focus on this and then, you know, being intentional about what we're training for there. So I think that can be helpful. It keeps things fresh. The other thing that comes to mind, I think is, um, you know, there's a role for somebody with a little expertise in this stuff to be able to support, whether it's, you know, somebody who's like a, you know, school psychologist, right? Somebody who's an SEL coach, right? Or somebody in the school who just has more experience or on webinars kind of learn from folks. Um, but I think the other thing is, is supporting folks. And the way I do it at Wisconsin is, you know, our educators, their roles are strength coaches, performance nutrition coaches, right? Um, academic advisors, as well as sport coaches. So how to give those people tools that they can start to introduce, you know, in ways that feel comfortable for them, these sorts of practices as well. So not just relying on one person to do it, but, you know, like a light train the trainer so folks feel comfortable bringing it into their own environments in the same way that, you know, if a classroom teacher is doing a certain mindfulness or SEL thing that works, it's really great when the special teacher picks it up, right? Or at a different level, right? If it's happening in, you know, geography in high school it's really great if it starts to happen in you know the literacy side of you know, the house as well you had talked a lot about like that resiliency and ability to recover from various you know various things that you know come up during your day and then you also increase uh, you also uh, discuss how you could possibly uh, increase the idea of like that flow state 
because I'm thinking like there are some times as a teacher where there are just weeks where I'm like, I'm just not at my best. I can tell. And then therefore I get frustrated or I'm like, wow, our class is really gelling. I want to keep that going. Um, yeah. How do you either shorten the slump or prolong the hot streak? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, immediately what comes up for me is I would just have a whole lot of curiosity, uh, to ask and, you know, an individual athlete or teacher kind of like what's going on so that we can, you know, figure it out more. So I just want to come back to that. Like just that curiosity, right? And curiosity is like a magic ingredient for finding helpful solutions. So, um, but then I think too, oftentimes, especially like in athletics, um, and I think this is true across domains, including education, uh, a slump can really happen when we start to get a little overly cognitive about it, right? So elite athletes aren't at their best. You know, we think about whatever sport, right? Like the best golfers aren't, you know, cruising, they're not like in that flow state when they're over the ball and thinking about it, right? Like they're trusting their swing, right? Um, And so I think in educators too, we can sometimes be a little too analytical about it, right? You know, where of course we need to think through, we need to have lesson plans, but like also flow state is something that's kind of felt in the body, right? So like, even if there's just that moment where it's like, ooh, I just picked up on that cue from that student, we were able to navigate, you know, to a new spot. And then we start to pay attention to those little moments. And then those little moments start to build. And it's not like, you know, and, and I'm not saying you were saying this, Nick, but like, we tend to like kind of oftentimes like throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, that right. month was a hot mess, right? You know, and it's like, right. well, maybe there were quite a few hot mess moments in that month, right? You know, but like, there were also a lot of really good moments in that month. So mm-hmm. kind of becoming a heat seeking missile for when are things going well? Mm-hmm. Uh, including those moments of like flow, those moments of like smoothness that happen during the day. I think mm-hmm. both can help us get out of slump, but then they also create the conditions for kind of that flow, you know, to happen more regularly. Right. I can see that being a really great opportunity for like leaders to step in or teachers to step in mm-hmm. on the behalf of students is to help them practice that. I mean, I was really taken back of the, to like kind of, curb the tide of negativity bias is like appreciation, right? I think sometimes taking moments during your day to help people appreciate things that that's gotta be a habit. I'm, I'm assuming that. Well, and, and even there, like, so like, what if we like, and the more granular we get, right. You know, like the better. So if it's, you know, from leaders, right. Or like at a PLC or whatever the opportunities are, or just informally talking, you know, educator to educator, um, and, you know, what went well today? Um, it could be something like, you know, I was doing this lesson. Um, they were in their small groups and student X, you know, said this particular thing. This is the instructional move that I made. And this is what happened. And then this is what it felt like for me, like in my body, like really yeah. specific and granular, uh, the better. Love that. Um, one that I just wanted to make sure. I asked before I let you go is what are some theories that you're testing or some ideas that you're testing when it comes to this, uh, this world of meditation and mindfulness? Uh, Yeah, I'd say like what comes to mind for me is um, I have long, I remember sitting in staff meetings as an educator and a leader would get up there and say, you know, hey, it's really important that all of you are taking care of yourself. And then we'd spend the next 45 minutes on all the things that we're not doing well enough and need to get back to that. And that always felt hollow to me, right? It always felt like they're just saying it because they have to say it. Um, And and that a teacher's well-being, a teacher's ability to manage their inner life it's kind of something they should just figure out on their own. Well, what does it look like when we start to integrate this like into the rhythms of our day, when we prioritize giving time to it on a professional level? Um, you know, we would never, I mean, some people would probably laugh at this. We would never give like a new literacy curriculum uh, and not train people up on how to use it. Maybe we don't love the training. Right. Anymore, right? You know, but like we, we just wouldn't do that. Right. Um, yeah, we just expect people to be able to navigate, you know, like the stress and challenge of being an educator without giving them tools to be able to work with it. 
And the last part of this that I think is, when I think about like the future of this, is if I were to show up in a high performance environment, whether it's tactical business, and education definitely has this, but education is somewhat more open, but I think there's still some of this. And talk about self-care, sometimes some people are like bristle, right? They're like, I'm over here or like getting done, right? You know, like I don't have time for that, right? You know, like, so I think when we start to enter with like, yes, this can help you with your performance, right? This can make you a better teacher, leader, tactical athlete, whatever. Um, and it can help you be a happier, healthier person. Like it's a both and sort of thing. Right. Um, so I think that kind of front edge of, you know, your performance is, is going to benefit and it's not at odds with you taking care of yourself. In fact, it's deeply integrated. Perfect. Um, well, Chad, thank you so much for being our season finale today. Um, this is only the beginning of the conversation. Um, my contact information is right there. We just for all of you, um, we're you know offering a one-on-one -on -one free consultations for work within this world of whether it be teacher retention and recruitment. I know that is very closely tied to this strategic planning. How can you um, layer in? And um, teacher mental health into the plans that you have for your district. Feel free to reach out to me, and I can connect you with uh, like the person, the, the point, the point person for all of that. But I just wanted to close our time together this year by saying thank you um, for you know being a part of this little community that we've cultivated over the last what is it it's eight months now. Um, and uh, thank you for coming today, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.